your first service of the day, make some noise. You slept in, you ain't gotta go to work tomorrow, you better shout me down tonight. It's gonna be good, it's gonna be good. Would you, would you go with me, I wanna jump straight into this word. Would you go with me to the gospel according to Mark? Mark, Mark chapter eight, come on. I don't really care about that. Verses 22 through 26. Mark chapter eight, start at verse 22 through verse 26. How many of you got a Bible we can make you call like a for real Bible church? Send me a spiritual, got you a real Bible. I love it. Some of you are glowing and charged up your Bible. I appreciate you. Mark chapter number 8. We'll start with verse number 22. A brand new message that I'm doing, but I really believe God's going to speak to you through this. It says, They came to Bethsaida. And some people brought a blind man, begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And he had spit on the man's eyes. Put his hands on the cemetery, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus asked, if you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. Now that's where that sentence should end. Like, I'm good, I see people. But it doesn't end there. He said, they look like trees walking around. And of course, I see, but it's, it's not really clear. So once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open, and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't even go into the village. What an interesting passage of scripture. I want to preach to you tonight, not long, probably about three and a half hours. <laughs> now, I'm going to use a title. I'm going to use a title. I use a phrase that I would say if we were chilling at your house watching a Denzel Washington movie. Okay? Any Denzel movie. Before the movie even starts, I'm going to look at you and say my title for tonight. That is, I've seen this before. I've seen this before. Would you look at your neighbor, whichever one you like the best, and get in their face, get in their personal space and say, neighbor? Come on, don't be afraid to talk to your neighbor at the pop in. Come on, say, neighbor? I've seen this before. Woo, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Speak to our hearts today. Let your word come alive today. Thank you that your word is light. It is illumination. Let the light come on for somebody today. In Jesus' name. Everybody say it. I've seen this before. This on fam, my wife and I, we have three children. Three little humans. Three, three reasons to have a real prayer life. <laughs> there is Everly, uh, I think we got a picture of her. She is four. She's four. She's my oldest. There is Robert Madu the third. He is three. That's my man child. And then there is Remington Elaine. Going on 20. And she is, she's my favorite. She is my favorite. She's my favorite. Now, I know, I know some of y'all are judging me right now. You're like, Robert, you cannot say that. Parents cannot have favorite children. I disagree. I disagree. Because kids have favorite parents. Okay? And my other two have made it blatantly obvious that their mama is their favorite. Okay? So you know why Remy's my favorite? because I'm her favorite, okay? Yes, yes, my relationship with Grimmy is like our relationship with Jesus. We love him because he first loved us. Yeah, you call him parents, I call him good parents. Anyway, uh, my, my daughter Evie is for, she is in a unique uh, imaginative phase right now. She's in a unique phase. She uh, used to be in like superhero, I'm oh, no, not superhero, I'm sorry. She used to be like in princess phase, princess phase. Everything was Elsa, Anna, Mohana. But now, now she's in superpower, friends. Everything is superpowers now. Everything is daddy has superpowers. She was about super girl. Everything is superpowers. It's amazing and annoying at the exact same time. Like, I'm not kidding. I will be eating dinner, eating dinner, and my four-year-old Eva will come in and she'll go, <laughs> I'll be like, what? Daddy, I just freezed your hands. You can't eat anymore. 
okay, first of all, it's Rose. Great one. And, uh, <laughs> can you unfreeze my hand so I can eat my food? She's like, okay, unfreeze. People, me and Taylor, my wife, will be in the middle of a conversation. Here's my TV. <laughs> you always have to wait to see what it is. I, I just squeezed your mouth. I'm like, okay, Evie. Can you unfreeze my mouth so I can finish the conversation with your mommy? Okay, I'm freezing. Yesterday, I'm watching TV at the house, chilling on the couch. Here comes TV. <laughs> freeze is her only power. That's the only thing she got. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I just freeze your eyes. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. I almost said unfreeze, but I'm like, hold on. I can give me a nap here. Right? <laughs> I'm like, oh, keep it, keep it, keep it. But everything is superpowers. And, and what makes her fake superpowers so real is the fact that I placate to it. Like, whatever she says freeze, I do it. Come on, all of us do that. You have to play along with the superpower. This is actually the superpower that every kid has. The power that every kid has is their ability to make grown, tax-paying adults play pretend again. You understand that? Okay, if you realize all I gotta do to make anybody in this room look crazy, all I gotta do is bring a four-year-old girl in here with a pink plastic Barbie phone, okay? Except that little girl go, hello? Oh no, they're right here. It's for you. I bet you answer that phone. I bet you answer that phone. A phone from the Bronx is going to answer that phone. Hey, hello, you crazy? If you don't answer that you have to play into what they do. But I think to a whole other level. push button from the door. And so I go and I stand by the little automatic push button from the door. And I go, hey, Evie, see if your superpowers will open the door. See if it'll work. And she goes, Phew. as soon as she did, I leaned on the button. Phew. That door opened. My daughter looked at her hands exactly like Peter Parker did. When he went, I see the Spider-Man. It was messed up the whole day. Then she really turned up her superpowers. Phew. Everything was freezing. To the point we're driving home, we're driving home on the highway, on the highway. And she's like, Daddy, I just freeze your hands. I'm like, oh, Daddy's driving. She's like, no, I just freeze your hands. And then finally in frustration, I just looked at my four-year-old daughter and said, Evie, I think your superpowers are running out. She said, they are? I said, yeah. I think your superpowers are running out. And is that statement is actually the impetus and the catalyst for our message tonight. Because what makes this miracle of Jesus in Mark chapter 8 is not only profound but provocative. The reason that this miracle is not just a mystery, but it is an anomaly, is because for the first time in the ministry of Jesus, somebody is touched by the hands of God. Somebody is touched by the only hands that can heal, the only hands that can set free, the only hands that can deliver, and after being touched by the hands of God, this blind man seemingly looks at Jesus and goes, Jesus, I think your superpowers are running out because uh, I can't see clearly like I know you God, but I think you glitching because I can't really see where I'm supposed to be. Well, I am confused as to why this miracle is in the Bible. I threw it, why is this miracle? You understand, you will not find this miracle in the Gospel of Matthew, you will not find it in Luke, you will not find it in John. Only Mark mentions this two-touch miracle from Jesus. And leave it to Mark to do that. The dude who is gangsta enough to not even discuss Jesus' birth. You know, he just starts with full grown Jesus. Only the dude that will skip Christmas will tell you the miracle where it takes Jesus two touches and he seemingly misses a free throw. Why is this miracle in the Bible? Here we go. If you're here today and you don't even acquiesce to the authority of Scripture and, and you think that the Bible is a conglomeration of fabricated fictional fairy tales and, and you actually scoff at the notion that Jesus had supernatural power and to you the ideology of his divinity is absolutely asinine and you think that miracles were made up by men to make Jesus look better? Either you gotta ask yourself then why they put this miracle in the Bible? Why? Put the two-touch miracle in the Bible. This makes no sense. This is not Jesus' 
power. He doesn't do two touch miracles. You understand, up until this moment in Mark chapter 8, it's like Jesus is an omnipotent Oprah. Because every person that comes to him, one touch, they get healed. You'll see it in the gospels. Like they come up to him and he's like, you get a miracle, you get a miracle, you get a miracle. Yeah, everybody gets a miracle. Jesus to touch you, to heal anybody. Why is this miracle in the Bible? You understand there are approximately 37 miracles that Jesus did in the New Testament. 37 recorded miracles. Now, you know, he did more than 37. Way more than 37. It's 37 that were recorded, but he did so many more than 37. So much more that when John concludes his gospel, he said, by the way, this is just some of the things I'm telling you that Jesus did, because if I recorded everything that Jesus did, there's not enough books in the world to contain all the miracles that God did. He did so many of them, and 36 out of the 37, one touch was enough. This is Jesus' campaign. I am a one-touch Savior. All it takes is one touch. If Jesus touches your eyes, you may as well get a Netflix account. You are bound to see. If he touches your ear, go ahead and buy the beat headphones. You are bound to hear. If you got a fever and he touches your forehead, you can forget about that fever. He's a one-touch Jesus. You understand if he touches your leg, you need to know what dance you're going to do when you get up. Because you ain't going to have time to practice as soon as he touches your leg. You're going to get up and start moving. Oh, he is a one-touch Jesus. And you don't want the person in the casket to come back from the dead? You better put a note on that casket. Do not touch Jesus. Because that's what happened in the Bible. Oh, yeah, there was a young boy who was being carried out in a funeral procession. And Jesus rolled up in name and touched the dude's casket. And that little boy came from the dead, was resurrected by one touch from Jesus. I want to make the point. I'm just saying that it's miracles free throws and field goals. Jesus don't miss. Why? Two touches. All of a sudden, one day, a blind man from Bethsaida is brought before Jesus. A blind man is brought by some people to Jesus in Bethsaida. Oh, how convenient. It's like I play that. All of a sudden, one day, some people bring the blind man to Jesus in Bethsaida. That's the some people. That's the blind man. And they brought him before Jesus. You know what they brought him? They brought him because he was blind. He was blind. So he had to be brought. He, he, blind people have to be brought. See, I, I'm about to have church because the miracle has already started. It's already started. Blind people have to be brought. He did not stumble upon Jesus. He did not find Jesus. He didn't Google to see where Jesus' location was. He had to be brought because he was blind. Because blind people cannot find anything. And I'm going to help some of you that's been saved for a long time. And you tell your testimony and you forgot you used to be blind. And you got the nerve, the audacity to say, I found Jesus a long time ago. Can I remind you, blind people can't find anything. You can find Jesus. He found you. And if you're looking for his grace, that will work in your life. Drawing you. Jesus, the fact that this man was brought to me is indicative of the fact that grace was already working in his life. Because he had to be brought. Wow. You could find him because you were blind. So I'm going to pause in the middle of this illustration. I first want to thank the some people. I want to thank you. I want to thank you, first of all, for bringing him. I want to thank you for having the wisdom, the bravery, and the courage to know that bringing him was your responsibility. Healing him was Jesus' responsibility. And all you have to do is just bring him. Jesus takes care of the healing. I 
want to thank you, Mr. Blanc, man, because you didn't have to come out here. You allowed them to lead you. You could have said, no, I'm not going anywhere, but you took the first step and allowed them to bring you out here. Now, here, here's what this illustration is going to get a little crazy. This live we had in Mark chapter 8. It's going to get crazy because to some people it's being played by Aldo and Natalie. Woo, I remember their names. And woo, the blind man is being played by my younger brother, Nathan. And because I am this. <laughs> Because uh, I'm executive producing this illustration, I have humbly accepted the role of Jesus. So uh, <laughs> don't at me. I'm trying to be like him anyway. So I got the mic. I can be the Messiah. So they the brought him before Jesus. Now my brother is not actually blind. Okay, not actually blind. We made him blind via this night mask that I got on a recent flight from Dallas to London. So <laughs> shout out American Airlines, our sponsor. And, so he's not really blind, but, but right now you can't you can't see anything right now, can you? Mike. Oh no, you can't. Okay, so we can't see anything. So so you you whoa, you're really blind right now. So because you can't see, he is currently experiencing, hear me, the vulnerability of having no vision. See, vulnerability is the byproduct of being blind. Heaven you don't have sight, you're vulnerable. Because void of vision, all you have is the voices of those around you. And you have to trust the voices of those around you to lead you. So their voice becomes your vision. So they can tell him anything. And he's got to believe it. Because he's like, it's not like he can Google it. He can't see. So you guys are powerful. You've been telling me that. You've been telling me he's got blonde hair. You've been telling me he's got ashy elbows. <laughs> you can tell him elephants are pink. You can tell him, oh, take 10 steps forward. God's got a blessing for you. <laughs> you can have him poison and say, it might taste funny. It's a new drink that Starbucks just put out. You can tell him anything at all. You are powerful. In your voice. I love this because this is a picture of our lives, isn't it? As soon as you're born, you are vulnerable to the voices around you. They can tell you anything because you can't see. Their voice becomes your vision. They brought him before Jesus. They said, Jesus, touch him. Read it when you get home. They didn't say heal him. They didn't say, you know, give him his eyes. They said, just touch him. That's clear brand identity. They're like, Jesus, all we know is one touch from you is all it takes. I love that Jesus, the first thing he does is not to touch this man's eyes. The first thing Jesus does is he takes his hand and he says, come on, follow me. Yeah, I'm not worried about your eyes yet. I'm going to take your hand. You guys can leave because I want some one-on-one -on -one time with him. I'm so glad that Jesus didn't touch his eyes and he touched his hand and told him to follow him because he's given us a picture of what the embryonic stages of faith looks like. That faith is leaving the voices of the people that used to lead you and tell you who you are and to trust even when you can't see, follow me. To take a step, take one big step. Follow me another big step. And trust the new voice, the voice of your father, the voice of your savior. This is what faith looks like. It's to leave the voices that used to lead you and say, I'm going to trust a new voice of my savior. And let me tell you, your hair is not blind. It's black. And let me tell you, your elbows ain't ashy, and elephants ain't pink, and you are a child of God, and you're not dumb, and you're not stupid. Anybody know what it's like to have God work on your identity, and the people in your path try to tell you who you were. God says, take my hand, and let me tell you who you really are. This is what faith looks like. He says, let me show you what it is to follow a new voice. And the Bible says that Jesus took the man out of the village. Out of the village. Come on, we got to get out of this village. Come on, we got to get out of this village. You know why we got to get out of this village? Ooh, 
but you worried about your vision, I'm worried about the village. You gotta get out of this village. I know you're worried about your sight, I'm worried about your surroundings. We gotta get out of this village. I'm so glad that Jesus took him out of the village. That's the first step because he gave me my first point, and that is your village affects your vision. Your village affects your vision. Why else does he take a blind man by the hand before touching his eyes? And he says, we got to get out this village because you're worried about your eyes. I'm worried about your environment. Your environment is more powerful than your eyes. Because what good is it for me to give you new eyes and for you to go back to a negative environment? Your negative environment will jump up your new eyes. So before I deal with your vision, And somebody here tonight, you got to check your village because your village is jacking up your vision. Those negative people that are in your life, you know those people that light up a room when they walk out? Yes, those negative, always got something to say about God doing something great. Ah, I don't see that. Ah, nah. Get out the village. Your village affects your vision. He said, I'm not going to touch your eyes. I'm going to take your hand and get you out of this village. You know why? Because there's nothing worse than being in Bethsaida. You go to the trip with a travel agent, don't go to Bethsaida. That was the village that he had to get him out of. Did you know why Bethsaida is so bad? There's some cities that I didn't know. Jesus had a top three city list of cities he couldn't stay in. And Bethsaida made the list. I want you to see it. Yeah. chapter 11. Yeah. These are the cities Jesus can't stay in. Matthew chapter 11, I think it's verse 20. He says, then Jesus began to openly denounce the cities where he'd done most of his mighty miracles because the people failed to turn away from sin and return to God. He said, how tragic it will be for the city of Corson and how horrible for the city of Bethsaida. For if the powerful miracles not performed in Corson and Bethsaida had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have humbled themselves and repented and turned from their sins. Bethsaida, hear me, is the place of unbelief. It's the place where Jesus did all these miracles to reveal he was the Son of God and they refused to believe because you cannot make somebody see what they are committed to not see. Oh, there's nothing worse than being in the place of unbelief. So he said, I gotta get you out. We ain't even out this village yet. Come on, take one more big step. Get out of that city. That village is affecting your vision. And you cannot convince people to see something that they are committed to not see. Your village affects your vision. Once you got him out of the vision, he's like, all right, now let's work on your eyes. Now this is my brother, and I got to be real to the text. Because the Bible says, <laughs> the Bible says that the next thing Jesus did, <laughs> oh, the next thing, after he got him out of the village, oh, <laughs> He's like, oh, you spill me, I promise you. I promise you it's gonna be a fight after this. <laughs> Woo, I'm not gonna you calm down, although I should to be true to the text. <laughs> the Bible says that the Holy One
Depends how you see it. Yes. Is he being nasty? Or spitting actually the kindest thing that Jesus could have ever done? Do you know anything about the context of the text? In that culture, they actually believed, hear me, that spit had medicinal power. They believed almost to the point of superstition that there was healing power in spit. So when Jesus spit in this dude's eyes, do you know what he was doing? He was actually doing the kindest thing anybody could have ever done. He's going, I understand y'all got a cultural belief that spit has the power to heal. But guess what? It doesn't. I got the power to heal. But if spit is your starting place of belief, I'm willing to meet you where your starting place of belief is. The power is not in the spit. The power is in me. But if spit is where you are, I'm willing to come right where you are and meet you at your starting place of belief. I'm telling you, if spit is where you're at, I, I will spit right in your eyes to show you that yes, it starts with spit, but the power is not in the spit. The power is in me. But I'm willing to meet you where you submit to you that spitting in this dude's eyes was the kindest thing Jesus could have ever done because he was willing to meet him and where his faith began. Yep. Ooh, you know what trips me out about church people today? And I meet church people who've been in church a long time, know a lot of scriptures, but don't know spit. Don't know, I mean, know a lot of scriptures, don't know spit. Nothing. Can't recognize spit because that's what spit is. Spit is your starting place into truth. And every person in here had a starting place into truth. You did not come in the world saved. I know you act like you did. You did not float in this room. You had a starting place in the truth. Can I tell you what I love about Hillsong Church? Is Hillsong is a place that welcomes spit. That you can come in here and not like the songs. You can think this is the worst sermon ever. But guess what? You still gonna get love. Somebody's still gonna hug you. I love that this is a church that will allow people to have a starting place in the truth. Fit. He said other people want you to just come in and know all the scriptures and float in the room. So he said, it spits where you start. I'll spit. And then all of a sudden, after he spit and touched his eyes, this is where the miracle should have turned into a shout. After he spit and touched his eyes, this dude should have said, that's, that's what should happen. This is the pattern. This jacked up miracle in Mark. After he spit, turns through his eyes, look what Jesus does. I want you to see it. He asked the question. Put the question on the screen. He asked the dude, can you see or do you see anything? Since when does Jesus do follow-up questions? <laughs> Do you see anything? He doesn't even sound like the Messiah. He sounds like a magician trying to card trick for the first time. Talk about, is this your card? Why is he asking this dude a question? No, he's not asking a question so he can get knowledge. When Jesus asks you a question, please believe the answer is never for him. It's for you. He knows. Come on. Come on. Yeah. I think he was asking, do you see anything? Because he wanted to see if this man would be honest enough to admit. But I did not take you blind to sight. I took you from blind to blurry. And I did it on purpose. Because I wanted to see, would you be honest enough to tell me that you can't really see? You can see something. But it's blurry. What do you do when Jesus takes you from blind to blurry? Some church people don't like that. 
you want Jesus to take you from blind <coughs> straight to sight. <laughs> but this text is proof positive that every once in a while God will all purpose take you from blind to blur. He will purposely jack up the lyrics of Amazing Grace. <laughs> I was was lost, but
gonna get it in a minute. You said you see people, and they look. Hold up, they look. They look like. What you mean like? You just got your vision. How about look like? They look like what? Like what? Are you smoking trees? Cause when did you see trees? Wow, yes. Since Good. when do you have a point of reference when you were blind? Right, come on. The only way he can say that they look like trees right. is if he saw trees right. before. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, the power of this text mm -hmm. is not that Jesus took a man from blind to blurry, to sight. The power of this text is this man went from sight to blind, to blurry, back to his sight. Wow. Him, this man saw before. His sight was never received. It was restored. This is the story of a man who went from sight to blind, to blurry, back to sight. Now you can go. Sight to blind, blind to blurry, blurry, back to sight. Sight to blind, blind to blurry, blurry, back to sight. I feel a mixtape. Sight to blind, blind to blurry, blurry. Oh, y'all still standing behind those trees? <laughs> my bad, my bad, y'all can go, y'all can go, y'all can go. I missed that, I missed that, I'm sorry, my bad. Actually, wait, hold up! Hold up! Hold up! Come back. Stand in the middle. Because I've seen this before. my two trees <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out when have I seen sight to blind blind to blurry blurry back to sight is that not the story of humanity is that not the story of creation please understand we were not born blind I was born perfect I was created in the image of my God I had 2020 vision until Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit and sin entered the world and when sin entered the world all of humanity went blind we went from sight to blind and how many know for years it was blurry redemption was blurry so yes David defeated Goliath but it was blurry yes Moses lifted up his staff and people got set free but it was blurry yes Noah saved some people on the ark but it was blurry but how many are thankful in Bethlehem one day Jesus tells this man. Y'all can go. Thank you so much. Look at the last thing, the scripture, the last verse, the last words of Jesus to this dude. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go to that village. Don't go back to that village. You got your new sight. In other words, the third point, restoration requires redirection. Once he restores that which has been lost, don't go back to the village that's going to jack your vision up. 
trust him for what's ahead. I've seen this before. Can I pray with you to bow your heads? Father, thank you for your word. Father, I pray for my brother, I pray for my sister, who right now, perhaps they're in the blurry season. And Lord, the picture is not clear. Lord, I pray that they would trust you even when it's blurry. Lord, thank you for this strange miracle when you healed a man with two touches to remind us today that you still heal us in the process. I pray you would give us the strength to trust you even in the process. In Jesus' name, everybody loves Jesus. Would you give God the best praise that you got this praise?